this one. don't know me, I'm Eva Lisa Pelkon and assistant dean and professor here at the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, Francesco asked me and uh, Greg Buckley, uh, associate professor at the Department of Art History, to respond to his book. So each of us will give a 10 minute presentation and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. So uh, let me start. As the cover of the book indicates, uh, Screening Fears traces various screen typologies from 19th century phantasmagoria to contemporary screen-infested culture. I will focus my response on the chapter entitled Cinema, a space for comfort, uh, because it tangents my expertise in 20th century architecture. That chapter discusses how the technical apparatus of the filmic media, combined with the space of the movie theater, allowed our audiences to retreat into what Francesco calls, quote, projection protection complex. That's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Francesco's book, all the chapters are uh, uh, in the. <laughs> Introduced by, by this intermezzo. So the intermezzo that proceeds the cinema chapter, uh, uh, Francesco exemplifies the phenomena of protection, projection protection complex by citing the climax of the 1932 horror film, The Most Dangerous Game, where a woman and a man are cast ashore on a small island only to find out that their host the evil Count Salov has caused the shipwrecks to catch human prey for his sinister hunting game. So let us watch the... Uh, what can I do? Okay. points out, when viewed from the darkness of the cave, the opening, opening of the cave functions like a screen, exposing the perpetuators uh, to Eva's and Robert's gaze. The cave functions, in other words, as a prehistoric precursor of the protection, projection protection complex. I won't get it right. Uh, so let me now focus on Francesco's discussion of the Film Guild Cinema, which was built in 1929, around the time that movie was made, which was designed by the exiled Austrian architect Friedrich Kiesler, who is best known for the architects in this room by his game-like Endless House project. I'll talk about that later. Francesco cites a passage where the architect describes his movie theater design as follows. So this is Kiesler. The most important quality of the auditorium is its power to suggest concentrated attention and at the same time to destroy the sensation of confinement that may occur easily when the spectator concentrates on the screen. The spectator must lose himself in an imaginary endless space even through the screen implies the opposite. So the two images included in the chapter illustrate this push and pull between attention and immersion. 
The film is screened onto the white screen at the end of the room, while the black side walls are used for additional protections in a manner that turns the experience into what the film weekly called a complete illusion of reality. On the right, you, by the way, see that endless house project that I will talk about later. I want to draw your attention to the porthole-like mechanism Kiesle called screenoscope. It can be interpreted either as a technical machinery or maybe as a human eyelid. In the former instance, the viewer is envisioned to occupy a space inside a camera, while in the latter scenario, Sitting in the movie theater simulates the experience of inhabiting the human psyche, perhaps. I propose that Kiesler, who had a lifelong interest in psychoanalysis, might have aimed at the latter. The Endless House project offers some clues. Some biographical data is necessary at this point. Kieslecke gave his architectural education in Vienna in the 1910s and moved to New York in 1929-26. Reading Freud led him to develop a theory where architecture functioned as a defense mechanism against the outside world. The early designs for the endless house read almost as a literal translation of Freud's diagram of the human mind. While living in New York in the 1930s and 40s, Kiesler befriended the psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich, whose theory of human existential strife, called ergonotics, orgonotics, proposed that all human action is based on the alteration between expansion and contraction. The former aided towards the world, and finding pleasure outside the self, while contraction signaled the opposite, sorrow and retreat into the self. Kiesler began at this point to see architecture as a prothesis that helped to establish quote unquote balance of forces between expansion and contraction. Such push and pull is operative in the skin of the 1947 version of the Endless House project entitled Paris Endless. You see that on the left. Around the same time, Kiesler wrote the manuscript, unpublished manuscript, entitled Magic Architecture, Its Origins and Future. This is sometime around 1947, which focused on prehistoric and animal architecture. This page from the unpublished manuscript, seen on the left, makes Kiesler's interest in prehistoric cave dwellings and paintings evident. The Lascaux cave had been discovered just a few years prior. The Endless House gained its final cave-like form shortly afterwards, around 1950. It's hardly an accident that Carl Jung's popularity peaked around the same time. In one of the lectures, the popular Swiss psychoanalysis drew the analogy between transhistorical cave motif and the human psyche, particularly with its fear of death. Carl Jung is on the, on the bottom right. He even built himself an underground cave-like structure at his home on Lake Zurich. To be sure, Kiesler was hardly alone in his cave obsession. Besides the Hollywood films, prehistoric caves solicited wide range of interest from anthropologists, ethnographers, and art historians who focused on the question, what prompted our ancestors to go through all the trouble to paint pictures of the walls of those dark caves where they could really be seen. After all, the cave dwellers did not even live in the interior of these cavities, 
but rather under the eaves at the mouth of the caves. One of those that participated in these speculations was the architectural historian Siegfried Gideon, who in his 1957 book, Eternal Present, argued that the cave was preserved, the interior of the cave was indeed preserved as a site for, quote, magic symbols. And what prompted the cave dwellers to go through all the trouble of covering walls of the dark caves with paintings of bisons and other things had nothing to do with representation and optics, but with existential strife. He was along the same lines with you. So let me conclude by stating that maybe Kiesle too conceived the film film cinema in a similar manner as a modern day cave filled with magic symbols. start by saying um, what a pleasure it is to respond, to be asked to respond to Francesco's book today, and, and really to say that these remarks are a small token of gratitude for um, just some really rich collaborations that I've been fortunate enough to undertake with Francesco uh, over the last few years here at Yale. It's really been a pleasure. So I think, thank you on behalf of myself, also perhaps if I can on behalf of the architecture school, because we're lucky to have you as a friend, and hopefully tonight as Small, a small measure of, of gratitude. Uh, I'll try and keep it really short as well. Um, and I'll begin just by noting some of the general features of the book. And then in the second part, uh, speak a little bit to what I think might be some of the implications for thinking about architectural history through some of the concepts that Francesco has developed. And I'll, I'll try and wrap it up with two questions, just two questions for a, a book that deserves really many, many more and will generate, no doubt, many, many more. So I'll begin with three general observations about the book to serve as a, as a frame for, I think, the book's central offering, this concept of protective media, in order to help us think about how such a concept might unsettle or defamiliarize our habits for looking at architecture. If this were a presentation in the film and media program, there would be a whole different set of questions, and indeed I hope there will be an event in the film and media program to, to open up those questions as, as well, but I will approach this from my own background as, a, as an architectural historian. One of the many pleasures of reading the book is to watch how Francesco's developed his dialogue with the field of architecture in teaching, in events, in publications here in the school into a whole new conceptual framework for thinking about the long history of screen media. Cinema has long served as the privileged reference point for conceptualizing themes of movement, flow, and time in architectural theory. Today, however, cinema is just one of many cultural forms uh, among a proliferating array of platforms through which moving images are produced and circulated. And I think it's precisely this book's effort to develop uh, a spatial and environmental vocabulary that moves from a concept of cinema, without of course abandoning it, uh, to a broader historical media theoretical concept of screen that makes it important for anybody interested in the relationships between the built environment and the operations of media technologies. And while it undertakes this fundamentally uh, difficult task, I was struck also by the book's ability to remain accessible and even intimate with the reader. Reading it almost feels like going on a walk with Francesco, uh, despite the high level uh, theorization that's going on. It not only uh, mounts an argument, therefore a rare ambition, it offers a model of writing that combines accessibility and familiarity with an extraordinarily difficult uh, synthetic task, weaving together not only deep familiarity with film criticism, uh, an incisive ability to mobilize and reinterpret key moments in film history, an archivist's sensibility uh, for leveraging the importance of a varied historical detail, and of course a high-level theoretical awareness that forges some unexpected uh, links between philosophy, architectural theory, and, and film theory. Finally, this isn't a book that's content to reiterate the knowledge and themes gathered across a long career, though of course Francesco could easily have done that. Rather, it's a book that's motivated to respond to recent events, at once to the transformations that uh, changing screen media have brought about in our contemporary life world, 
uh, in the recent decades, but also to the very specific experiences that characterized governmental and institutional responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, experiences that are now receding into the just past, and which we might be all too prone to forget, but which in fact I think this book says we should not forget, and in fact we should uh, engage uh, theoretically at the highest level. So tonight I want to think about the richness of the book's central arguments in order to draw out the ways in which uh, they can help us think about architecture and the built environment in some new and different ways. Uh, and this only speaks to a certain aspect of the book, as I've mentioned. In particular, I want to think about the book's concept of protective media uh, across three broad historical moments, and Ava already alluded to these. We have the late 18th century, the early 20th century, and our own time. And it's tempting to argue that screen media operate very differently in each of these moments, both because of their historical or perhaps their media specificities. The book, however, makes a different argument. Uh, in fact, it argues that it's helpful to think of them as part of a single continuous complex, the projection protection complex, a complex re that reveals itself precisely in the ways that screen media and architecture reciprocally configure each other. So the Parisian phantasmagoria assembles spectators amid the ruins of a former convent, and Francesco details that spatiality with incredible richness, to witness ghostly apparitions that move mysteriously as if they're emanating from the very air of the room in which they appear. The picture palace, uh, like Midtown Manhattan's Roxy, which is a centerpiece of another chapter, organizes a vast audience before a f the frame of a movie screen by means of the ambiguous techniques for deriving spectator comfort ranging from opulent ornamentation to air conditioning, uh, services like toilets and chilled water, right down to the various ways in which ushers uh, both uh, help people move through the complex, but also supervise them with an almost military uh, discipline. And finally, uh, the third moment of the complex, we arrive at viewers who, f in focusing on the screen of their laptop or their smartphone, enter into what Francesco theorizes as a strange bubble whose contours both belong to the peripersonal space of their own bodies, but also to a much harder to define virtual boundary, one that's characteristic of the various online worlds to which they're exposed through their screens. Now, rather than conceive of these as stages in some sort of teleological progression or technological evolution, the book argues that what makes them comparable is a twofold operation. First, a form of spatial enclosure excludes the immediate surroundings, while an optical surface reestablishes contact with an outside world, whether that contact be factual or virtual. To understand screens as a form of protective media asks that we think of the screen in a fundamentally different manner. To understand it not as a surface of display alone, but rather as a technology with the capacity to simultaneously disconnect us from our surroundings and then reconnect us with the world in a different manner. The desire to disconnect from our surroundings, the book argues, responds to a pervasive sense of anxiety when confronted with the outside world, an anxiety that screens compensate for, not only through the image, but by operating as shelters and as filters. Now, at the same time, screen media have the ability to preserve a sense of connection with the outside, operating as interfaces that regulate the exchanges between that side and this side of a barrier, or by creating a kind of niche or zone <coughs> in a broader environment but that nonetheless remains autonomous from that environment. I want to underscore two key aspects of uh, the, the protective media hypothesis that uh, Francesco outlines. First, protection is paradoxical. Uh, by no means should protection be confused with hiding behind a wall, um, shutting a door, or hermetically sealing oneself. What the book asks us to consider, and I think this is one of its profound points, uh, is that the ways in which we seek protection from an external threat does not simply involve us in isolation or retreat. It produces a relationship with an outside. It informs and distorts our mode of engaging with a broader world. Seen in this perspective, the notion of protective media, or perhaps uh, some notion of protective mediation, can productively prompt uh, the architectural discipline to revisit many of its canonical sites. This would include uh, prisons, like uh, Piranesi's imaginary prisons from the 18th century. 
It could include grottos, of which there are a great many in uh, uh, architectural history. Gates, perhaps like our own Phelps Hall of 1895, which is certainly a protective architecture, uh, protective medium. Uh, bunkers of the kind that were studied by uh, the architect and theorist Paul Ferrillo. Or even uh, domes, uh, those devices of, of great fervor and liberation from the 1960s, like Buckminster Fuller's uh, celebrated infamous dome over Midtown Manhattan. At the same moment being erected while ray domes were uh, creating the infrastructure of Cold War surveillance throughout the Arctic using some of the very same principles. I think protect, uh, the notion of protective media might allow us to return to these with a fresh eye. But in doing so, I would say we shouldn't mistake protective media for an ontological category, a new umbrella term for any architecture of defense. I think the concept of protective media entails, and above all, an attention to operations. Uh, and I think this contributes to an exciting conversation between architectural history and media theory over the last few years, which has moved away from thinking of media in ontological categories, as say, mass media, in order to think about uh, the technical operations that shape our very relationship to the world. In this sense, the notion of protective media or protective mediation provides a theoretical framework for analyzing not only defensive walls, but the ways in which surfaces, envelopes, ventilation systems, and electronic networks combine protection and projection, disconnection with reconnection, sheltering and exchange across a barrier. So with that, I have two main questions that I wanted to pose to Francesco and indeed to all of us tonight. First would be, what does it mean to rethink projection today? Uh, one place to thicken the conversation between media theory and architectural theory, I think, lays in how the projection-protection complex might engage notions of protection in architecture. To what extent might the concept of projective media that Francesco develops be extended beyond the specific lineage traced in this book of the phantasm phantasmagoria, the cinema, and then the digital bubble? The book engages projection as projected light, uh, light which passes through lenses onto receiving surfaces. But within architectural history, projection has a somewhat different and indeed broader uh, meaning. Projection pertains not only to light projected on a screen, but to a whole range of techniques that allow for three-dimensional things to become two-dimensional drawings, and vice versa, for two-dimensional drawings to become three-dimensional things. Robin Evans, who is one of the great historians of this process, observed that the, autom the automation of projection in photography, in film, and in television uh, today we might think of any number of computerized design programs, has impeded our ability to recognize how strange and mediated this process of moving between two and three dimensions, uh, in fact, is. Uh, and I think uh, it's striking, indeed, that so many of the founding documents of architectural projection, whether it be orthographic projection in the 16th century, descriptive geometry in the 17th century, or uh, the codification of uh, axonometric projection in engineering drawings in the 19th century, all of these have very close connections to military knowledge and military techniques, whether it's fortification, uh, describing the trajectories of, of weapons, or uh, the building of defensive machinery. Uh, all of them are bound up with defensive knowledges of some kinds. And I think the book really invites the field to revisit these operations of projection as protective mediations. The book invites the field to revisit these and think through how uh, the established ways of defining and re representing relationships between inside and outside, front and back, up and down, have also been involved in a kind of uh, protective mediation. <coughs> to consider these uh, modes of graphic projection as protective mediations, I think would compel the field to embrace a broader and perhaps more dialectical understanding of projection as central to the cultural techniques through which architecture constituted itself as a separate discipline. I think this would also mean extending the argument about the projection protection complex in a different direction, perhaps even further back in time, uh, beyond the phantasmagoria towards these uh, graphic practices of the 16th through the 18th century, perhaps having a less evident relationship with screen environments. The second question would be, what does it mean to rethink enclosure today? And toward the end of the book, uh, Francesco highlights some of the darkest aspects of the protection projection complex. And to, to enumerate some of them, uh, just very quickly, all too quickly, these include the degree to which techniques for protection also subject the protected to forms of discipline. Screening techniques share a logic of immunization 
uh, he argues, that connects them with projects for biopolitical control. Reconnecting to the world via screens can be a profoundly derealizing process. Finally, uh, you highlight the way in which the, there's a deep danger that arises when one becomes accustomed to equating the surrounding environment with fear and suspicion. And in the face of all these threats carried by the projection protect, protection complex, you call for a rethinking of enclosure towards enclosures that are not limited to, quote, a sealed space. And this seems to be another moment where I think architectural theory and architecture and media theory might engage in a really productive conversation. In what ways what might media theory help architects think about enclosure differently? In what ways might those designing architectural enclosures offer material for thinking about media in new ways? And by that I mean, are some of the, today are not some of the most powerful enclosure operations at work, not necessarily those uh, which are the evident physical uh, uh, elements that separate inside from outside. And I'm here placing this image of a Google uh, data center up as one example of how the traditional notion of, let's say, enclosure as envelope is no longer sufficient to think about the kinds of enclosure that, let's say, Google uh, produces through its uh, proprietary uh, algorithms and through its collection of data. There are different levels of enclosure working here, from uh, the operation of Google's uh, infrastructural systems to its data centers uh, to the systems that are designed to house those. Uh, so where I guess I would at land here is to ask where might we think about this idea of a more porous idea of the place in your book uh, within the architectures of screens today, both those which are evident and those which are maybe so Thank I'll you. I'll end there. First of all, thank you. Thank you, my two presenters, uh, but thank you to everybody here. Many friends, uh, many new friends, uh, many students, uh, and I'm, I'm touched uh, by that. It's also true that uh, the book is deeply indebted uh, with this room, where I usually teach. And where I started to teach uh, years ago uh, here in the School of Architecture about the connection between media and space, which I think it's uh, an important uh, way to get to, to go against the idea that media are working everywhere, every time. It's not true. They are deeply indebted with the space. We are always in the space. We are always sitting somewhere, and including our cell phone. Our cell phone is always somewhere, with us or without us. So uh, there is, this, there is this, this element that I present this book uh, uh, here in the same room where I start to think about this book, uh, in which I put together, if you want, uh, on one side, uh, the problem of uh, media and space, uh, and also in another room in the same building where we taught uh, a, a fantastic uh, class on, on urban screens. Uh, then, then came the pandemic, and in a certain sense, the most immediate uh, way of thinking about the uh, um, um, protection, pro projection, protection, protection complex is the pandemic, the lockdown, this idea of uh, having relation with the other through at a distance uh, uh, with a mask or to a screen. But the book is not on pandemic, even though, of course, it's caused, it, it's determined by pandemic. Uh, the book, uh, it's, it's about modernity, and it's about uh, what, uh, what we are living in this moment. And if I have to summarize before going to the question, the fantastic question, thank you so much that you put, uh, I would say that the first impulse for the book uh, was my personal irritation as a scholar of media about thinking in a Macronesque uh, way that media are something to grasp the world, to conquer the world, to expand our possibilities. No, thanks God not. We are no longer in the age of possession. 
we are no longer in the age of, uh, I mean, uh, trying to extract uh, things to uh, uh, exploit the world. No, that's the time to be scared. And, uh, and this idea of including our fear in our logic of everything was the real impulse for writing this book. And how this is peculiarly true in the modern time, this is why I started from Phantasmagoria. That by chance I presented the, fun, the first chapter of on Phantasmagoria mm -hmm. here in the in the in, in the School of Architecture a couple of years ago when I had a lecture. And uh, you mentioned my ability as a theorist, more or less. I, I consider myself a theorist. When I when I I send the chapter on Phantasmagoria to a very famous journal, the peer review responded, this young guy knows, he's a great uh, archivist, he knows a lot about documents that we have never seen, but he lacks in theory. You have to read a book, and you mentioned a book in which I was. <laughs> the delights of the peer reviews. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, not by courtesy or, or compliments. Uh, I, I'm too old for, to make compliments or to receive compliments. But really, your questions are crucial. And uh, I will say your question is also what obsesses me now. I'm not, I'm not going to write a second book on that, but I'm rum ruminating about the topics of the book. And I start from you, Eva. Let me reveal one, one little secret. I was dreaming that Eva was speaking about that in, in, because the main character name is Eva. <laughs> and I was dreaming that you were interested exactly in this interval. Uh, I would say, as 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 a film uh, uh, buffer, I I I enjoy a lot much more our conversation than the stupid Eva in the movie. But that's another story. Uh, the cave. Yes, you're right. But it's exactly a problem to me, the cave. On one side, I'm totally fascinated with caves. Not only, of course, the double, double cave, the Plato's cave and the, and the, and the prehistoric caves. That's, that's immediate. That's immediate, uh, the reference of this idea of being restricted in a space and in the meantime protected in the space and in the meantime to be ready to get up the woman womb also is that. There is a lot of great metaphor there. But I think uh, ultimately that uh, what happens here is to speak with uh, Gruzin a deep remediation of the pre-modern times. I think that uh, the kind of things that protective media do is, for example, provide a technological version of the natural shields or natural, let's say, uh, 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 point of protection. Now we can escape technology in order to protect ourselves. And in this sense, I interpret the first, the, I started from uh, Phantasmagoria, which was precisely a, the first technological, uh, uh, technological uh, um, uh, dispositive. Uh, before the Phantasmagoria, uh, under uh, the impulse of uh, uh, Nicolas Hutor, who is here, I studied deeply uh, the Quaranto, Quarantore ritual, which was a, a Christian Catholic uh, ritual in churches, in which also they were provided a sort of uh, cave, uh, uh, vi I mean, a sort of virtual cave with strong lights uh, uh, and, and homilies pushing out uh, people to think about, uh, to think about the world. And, and exactly 
there is a discontinuity in phantasmagoria to respect to the previous rituals in the fact that, first of all, they were technologically based. Of course, there was a lot of technology in the 40 hours. That, I mean, the, 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 the painters, uh, uh, the church, all these kind of things. But here it was all the, let's say, the capitalistic technologies technologies were involved, uh, not only the projection, so a technical machine, but also advertising the technologies of, of, of directing, the, the, directing the, the crowd, all these kind of things. They are so typical of the modern times. I cannot avoid to think, uh, uh, when, I, when I think about uh, the, the uh, projection, projection complex, to think about uh, how the crowd is directed, uh, channeled, uh, also institutionally. Think about once again our lockdowns. We were was not an instinctual uh, reaction. It was a very very precise set of prescriptions and uh, and and directions. So came okay, yes. But you have to put, in a certain sense, some element of discontinuity, I think, in, with respect to the, to the epoch in which we live. And, and also the, the fears from which we are trying to protect ourselves are typically modern. Uh, I mean, I do not say that uh, nature was not aggressive in the Middle Age or whatever. Of course it was. But the perception of an aggressive nature is typically of, of modernity, I think. This is the first answer. The second, thank you, projection. It's, uh, it's, you're right. I, I studied too much protection and I have to study more about projection. And you're right, projection is a geometrical projection, is a psychological projection, is a military projection. This Morgan and G here, who, yeah, who, who is the great expert of projective pro and projectiles in, 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 in history of architecture and, and in real war. What does it mean projection? from this point of view, to cast something in another place. It seems to me that this transfer is the element I'm interested in. The very fact that once you are confined into a space, you are also projected outside this space. And this is why, for example, I study film as a form of compensation. As much you are obli even, even obliged to stay in, one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because I'm not able to stay at the movies on my, on my seat. I, I move too much. And I, I, thanks God there is nobody now I mean, <laughs> in the film theaters, so I, I'm more relaxed, but <laughs> I remember when I was young, it was terrible. And uh, I decided finally to stay where nobody goes, on the third row on the left. And I discovered this uh, fantastic place, but I didn't, I didn't understand the movies. That's most the problem, because looking this way, you do not see really well. So uh, I think it was a, an intimate revenge about projection. <laughs> uh, but I have to work more. But what does it mean to be cast? Mm -hmm. It's a compensation. I think, uh, basically, it, it is a form of compensation. It's not, uh, it's not a free a free movement uh, is not uh, an implicit uh, reaction, is uh, exact, again, uh, if I think to, to, the, to the age of capitalism in which we live, you get back this movement forward in exchange of something. Mm -hmm. This is why I think uh, that uh, uh, the idea of protection could be useful. Because 
there are two reasons. The first is because starting from this kind of dropping the word, you can understand how and in to what condition we can regain it. Of course, I, and I go back to the cave, you, cave, but also niche. It's easier stuff, uh, <laughs> Gary. The question of niche, and uh, <clears throat> you can you can articulate better this movement of uh, going back, being being protected, and having that as a condition for a development, for having another step. Uh, we say in your in your uh, in your evolution, uh, you could say. So this is uh, why pro projection is interesting. Also, projection is moving forward or putting forward means also that uh, what we learn being protected and how we apply what we learn being protected outside. So I'm shocked, for example, that my students are obsessively in need of protection. I can no longer call somebody by phone unless I send them a message in advance that I'm calling them. And uh, that's an element. That's the fear of, uh, the, uh, uh, of something that is unexpected. Uh, that's a way of putting a veil, putting a distance to putting something. And, uh, and so this is, I'm interested in the idea that this is the starting point today. And I know that uh, the, it's better the fairy tale that we are free, especially here in PA, where everything is in a fairy tale, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are free, we are moving forward. It's not true. It's the starting point is exactly this idea of the confinement, too. Uh, so projection comes second in my in my idea and in my opinion. First come closure. Mm -hmm. And what does mean the closure? Of course, bunkers. Uh, I have to say that I taught in class uh, the radio book on bunkers, which is a marvelous book. And uh, is a dreamlike book because putting together uh, uh, his own stories, etc., etc. But <clears throat> uh, there is a secret lesson in Virilio book uh, that, in a certain sense, uh, uh, yeah, that's the the path, the mental path of professors that are paid for making convoluted uh, 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 track uh, between uh, between books. That I, there is a kind of sensibility in Virilio, I, and I found in Ranciere the answer to Virilio, I, I confess. And the fact that uh, once we are closed, first we can feel to be part of the world. And in this fantastic chapter, uh, uh, separated uh, uh, and together, which is against the idea of Turtle that if you stay in your computer, you are completely isolated. Exactly because you are isolated. You are ready to become a member of a virtual community. Exactly because you drop something, you are ready to get something as a compensation. So the closure is on one side a physical, goes back to the cave, but also is a sort of existential condition in which I drop something in order to gain something else. Maybe it's too religious and sometimes I'm suspicious about myself, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's something in there. And what Virilio ultimately says is that visiting, visiting the bunkers of World War II that he have seen for the first time during the war, 
not only reconciliate with himself, with his memory, he reconciliates also with the other, but ultimately he reconciliates with his own fears. If we accept the condition of the closure as the first step for the exploration of the world, we can really deal with our fears and start from our fears in the journey toward the world. This is what ultimately I think is the lesson of the projection protection complex, in which I put projection first, but he comes second. So thank you again. Then I think uh, uh, we have time for question or counter question from you, etc. etc. Yeah, thank you so much for all three presentations. Um, I want to take up uh, the question of uh, uh, my colleague Craig uh, about uh, the uh, implication for architecture. Maybe we have to think architecture differently. And I was thinking, because it is a term of architecture that's so timely today, today, is the question about the Iron Dome. So is this architecture in the sense of, uh, uh, of what you develop as a protective, uh, projective uh, complex, uh, the Iron Dome? And uh, so, uh, and have we maybe also to, to think of uh, architecture as uh, as, uh, as a field that uh, does control space uh, differently uh, than only uh, uh, through concrete uh, walls. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, <clears throat> just a first um, a small personal fact. After the book, uh, not, not many weeks after the book came out, I was invited uh, in December in, uh, in, in a conference by the architects, I'm speaking about some of you. And, uh, and, uh, and I was ruminating, what, not, not to repeat the book, just exactly for, for people that are, that are doing the job of many of the students here, or many of uh, my colleagues here. Uh, <clears throat> And there is, uh, uh, there is 90 pages in the third uh, impossible volume of thought of Zlotterdijk about, uh, about, uh, about uh, spheres. Mm -hmm. The volume devoted to, to the form, in which he speaks about the city today. And the city as a form made a, f a number of little bubbles, individual bubbles, uh, and, uh, and uh, disconnected and interconnected each, uh, each other. But uh, a strange kind of sociality, which is so far from the rallies of the beginning of the 19th century, of the beginning of the 20th century. The crowd, the, the age of crowd is is done. Now the city is no longer the place of crowd. It's the place of the form in which and 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 with this idea I went uh, the other day to New York and it looked it looked like true in the way in which people are obsessively waiting, are obsessively responding to their uh, no longer conversation it's considered totally impolite to ask somebody in the table, even you cannot, uh, can I have your salt? <laughs> Which was, you know, the, the great uh, ways of, uh, of, um, of become friend is, can I have your salt? <laughs> or what a wonderful dog. <laughs> this is the two great ways. <laughs> now you cannot do anything. First, they, they do not have, they have cell phones and not dogs. And second, they are working on their cell phone and looking at their cell phone. So more than... I'm referring to uh, the Iron Dome that protects Israel. And yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> but he, more than that, to me, in this moment, uh, this kind of thinking applies even to the, do you understand, more than architecturally speaking, apply, for example, the apartments we have here one room, 
expensive. One room uh, for visiting professor, etc. This kind of uh, isolation reduction with all the all the technology inside to be connected with the world, but all the construction to be disconnected with the name from the neighbor. So of course the dome. There is. I I want to. I I'm I'm eager to. I, I promised uh, Morgan uh, to that I want to know more about fortification, walled cities, etc. Because I'm interested in these kind of things. But phenomenologically, I'm much more shocked today by a city which is no longer the city de de described by Benjamin as the spectacular city in front of, but it's on the contrary, the form in which all the people are restricted in their own bubble. And the sociality, nevertheless, there is a sociality, nevertheless. I mean, I hate this idea, this pessimistic, pessimistic uh, things that moralistic things are, oh, we are no longer together. Uh, oh, my my daughter spent too much time in front of the cell phone. Oh, my son plays uh, uh, video games too much. Thanks, God. Hi, Alessandra. I've got a question to claim, but the question follows up directly to what you were just saying. What do you think of the movies of dropping the screen? Of what is your stance on being more immediate? Because I feel like every time I speak with you, I feel this sense of, um, I don't want to say nostalgia, but desire for immediacy, a kind of like advocacy for immediacy. But reading your book, I haven't finished yet. I still have to get to the bubble, to the, to the digital bubble part, which you can maybe you'll answer. But Reading your book, I feel like the, the protection part of the protection projection complex is something that you don't feel like it is entirely a fascist kind of, a, a, you know, a power-driven enclosure, but it's also a comfortable option, something that can be desired, something that can that is not necessarily evil. The claim, uh, second part, is. I want to reclaim you as part of the field of Italian studies, <laughs> even if you are in the School of Architecture and you're presenting your book that on the website has no Italian studies <laughs> label. But I think there should be, because on one side, you, know, you start from, from Italian theory and from forgotten Italian theory, and that is, I want to thank you for that, for expanding what Italian studies means outside of Italy. But also because I feel like the prehistory of uh, of the freezing complex that you are, that you are, that, that, I'm, that I'm reading about in your book, is in Ariosto, and of course, like you know, I'm biased. But oh, when the the wizard, when Atlanta conjures an architecture, conjures the Castello di Atlanta, Atlanta's castle, um, and you know, Pirandello and Anton Giulio Bergaglia, who was you know a proto filmmaker, uh, claimed that that is the beginning of cinema because it's this kind of architectural complex that produces. Endless entertainment, in which everybody uh, who gets in the castle sees what they desire the most, and therefore stops, drops everything in their life just to be in this virtual space. Um, but what's the what's the real function? What what is the reason why Atlanta creates this uh, this literary invention? It's to protect the Ruggiero. Yeah. This is 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 the top of song to avoid that Ruggiero takes part in the actual war. And so he is, he is sort of like a captive, captive of, of the entertainment that, that his magic creates. It's a sort of universe, of architectural universe that he, as a male wizard, can only conjure in structure to keep him safe from reality, but not because of that outside of reality in a way. So I wanted to deposit this as a sort of prehistory of the modernity, the beginning of modernity in the recent yes. castle. Thank thank you. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I I respond to you and I go back to the question of caves. Mm -hmm. Of course protection is not modern any modern invention. That that's clear. And even we can uh, uh, we can detect uh, also trans-historical or uh, historical 
elements, for example, in Freud, you mentioned that this idea that there is the vesicle protecting the organism, mm -hmm. which is totally fascinating because it's, it, it says, uh, Freud in, in Beyond the uh, Pleasure Principle, he says something which was a, a lead element in my book. The need of protection comes first before the need of reception, mm -hmm. of the stimuli. I, I, so, <clears throat> of course, of course the castle, of course the cave. But now we can think in, uh, in, 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 uh, in terms of, uh, uh, we can think the cave in terms of the bubble, of the digital bubbles, because there is the digital bubbles. And we can think in terms of film uh, to Ariosto, because there is the film. So I would say that uh, uh, what matters uh, in the passage is the fact that uh, the operations uh, are transformed uh, and modernity provide, you are right, operations are all, m provide operation through technological means. That's to me something that I cannot drop. It's, it's, and it's not only, the book tries to say also, they do that with technological means and in a state of governmentality in which, for example, the institutions are ready to protect the subjects at the expenses of a, of a violence which is greater than the violence of the possible threats from external life. I mean, that's, that's to me, very clear. Our society spend a lot in order to protect themselves, spend more and use more violence for getting this task than the violence of the, of, of the world, of the catastrophes, etc. The cost of facing catastrophes is much bigger than the catastrophes of the possible catastrophes. So, first, the past is there because I can call it back with the consciousness of that, of today. <laughs> Second, it comes back with the operations that are performed in, not necessarily in, in modern time, but today are performed by means that are typically modern. This is my answer. So, <clears throat> from this point of view, it's also, I feel also authorized to make uh, uh, what the book tries to say, very simple, that uh, the question of power in the, this dispositive is crucial. Who's the power? The, who's, who is the protector? And that is ultimately the great question. And, uh, I do not want to uh, uh, to align with a Gamben in his analysis of uh, pandemic. Uh, it's completely crazy, but uh, the idea that, in a certain sense, the pandemic uh, displayed in full view the logic of protection is true. The protection cost. And uh, who is the advantage of this cost? And, and uh, in the book, sorry, in the book I, I, I moved two hypotheses. One is the disciplinary hypothesis. The advantage is that we become, once protected, we become docile bodies in Foucaultian terms. And the other is more, I mean, in the future is that, that the media are working no longer as tools for, for discipline, but tools for control, and, and they provide a previous control, giving us a sort of vaccine mm -hmm. to the, to the uh, dangers from outside. So that's movies did that very clearly. 
you are completely protected in the most relaxing place possible, the film theater of the 20s, and uh, uh, Joseph Roth, uh, the great, we, we love, uh, I, I guess both of us, we love uh, him, uh, says, okay, you, you see this horrible nature on the screen and you are in the most relaxed mm -hmm. place. But why we are interested in, why these horrible things, not only for, because we pay tickets for, for looking at the unhappy person, we do not pay ticket for saying stories. We do not read novel with happy people. We read novel with the unhappy people. And that's what it is not me. It was not a story to say that. And so the same for movies. We go we pay tickets for seeing in our unhappy people. But unhappy people work as a vaccine for us. Be ready. <laughs> Be ready and be safe. That is the great, is exactly the, 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 the logic of, of the booster. Uh, do that, do that uh, in perfect English. So I think that uh, you are perfectly right, as Eva is perfectly right, say case. But in the meantime, the implication from the point of view of technology, governmentality, and other things are that we are living a specific way of thinking about fears, protection, and projection. Hi, I have a... Oh, hi. 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 Uh, we're here in the nosebleed seats, <laughs> mostly anatomical theater. Um, I wanted to follow up on these last few, few comments, thinking about um, an example that's been very much in my mind, uh, a different form of urbanization, or a different drive to urbanization, which is drone presence in Afghanistan yeah. in rural areas, as an unprecedented driving motivator for why people move to cities, why they move to Kabul, because of the constant drone presence in places that are not enclosed. So again, picking up on Alessandro's discussion of immediacy, mm -hmm. and you know the nostalgia for immediacy, but what kind of immediacy? Not the immediacy of being shot from above in your head at any given point. Um, at the same time as our, hopefully our, experience of drone warfare is a highly mediated sense of culpability yeah. um, uh, from the enclosed spaces. So again, just thinking about um, the power flows, um, uh, the experiences of those same technologies, uh, and again, um, who who gets to avoid immediacy? <coughs> yes, I, I I I forgot the part of immediacy, and, and thank you so much because uh, once again, uh, Marita, you raised a, a capital uh, question. The drones uh, show us that immediacy is always mediated. I would say immediacy today is a byproduct of the mediation. And uh, uh, it's half true because I would say, in a some sense, we still have experience in which. Uh, we, for example, to discover the face of a friend as if you see him or her for the first time still happens. And that a moment, a sublime moment of immediacy. But this moment is more and more mediated. More and more I'm wondering about the beauty, about uh, a face at the movies and less in real life. Not because real life is not good, but, uh, but because we interpose always a sort of veil. I, there is a, a marvelous page by Desierto in, in a volume that is, is, not, is not, not often uh, uh, mentioned uh, and is maybe his best book, uh, on, uh, Sur les Croix, Unbelieving, in, which says, 
what happens to me today in Paris? Everything's so joyous, so happy, etc. Of course, I'm coming out from a movie. That's that's a great passage, you know. The, the mediation of medi of immediacy, and and this immediacy is is uh, you're right. Is is scary. Even though mediated is scaring because it's tied with the possibility to be hit uh, and uh, and. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you're dead. It's true also, and, uh, but I move not, not well. I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing a, a text for myself, not, not that, about, uh, about uh, uh, um, protection and exposure. What does it mean, the opposition? And I call this, uh, to two paradigm, two opposite paradigms for the time to come. I think uh, we are going to go to have these two aspects. Once again, is not the immediacy of the past. You you pay now for having an experience of a forest. Mm -hmm. You you pay for having the experience of get lost in the forest. Mm -hmm. You pay for risk your life in the mountains. So, and you go with the GPS and all these satel satellite uh, satellite uh, uh, instruments. Uh, uh, so immediacy and exposure are still there, but in the same time, they are different from a long tradition. And the long tradition behind, the long tradition is to kind of to kind of epistemology, the epistemology of the veil. I know things only when I know the veil, or uh, it's, uh, it's the, the, rea the reality beyond the veil is the veil, is Nietzsche, yeah? it's not that. Uh, that's a great, a great point. And the revelation, the two epistemology. Is reality revealing itself to me in a sort of immediate experience, immediacy, or is reality revealing me at the price of knowing which kind of veil is there? This is the two epistemological comp. Now that is restructured. These two traditions seems to me they are restructured. And the immersion of virtual reality in this sense is the compromise between the two. I do not know if I responded to you. Hi, Lydia. Thank you. Um, I do have a question, but also I have not read the book yet. So it's an uninformed question. No, it's not a problem. It can, it's, this provides the, 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 provide an exception to read the book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hearing you speak about this projection protection complex, I do wonder to what extent the complex can be also seen as a means towards self-destruction, uh, which is to consider, uh, you know, one that protects oneself is also in some way also destroying oneself. If you want to think, for example, of um, the example of the pandemic, right? Isolation is good, but also it is uh, negatively influencing or impacting one person as a sense of, you know, mental health is not so great because you are putting yourself in this environment, um, or to maybe use another example that uh, Foucault might approve of, this idea of solitary confinement as ultimately leading to a kind of self-destruction. So I wonder, you know, working within this framework of the dispositif, this idea of, yes, there are, you know, that power is inscribed within these spaces, but also within the framework of discipline and punish, I wonder if you would go so far as to say that ultimately they can form this kind of dialectic in which protection is also a kind, like brings with it a kind of destruction. Absolutely, yes, thank you. Ikomori is an example of that. Mm -hmm. you, you stay confined and ultimately, but is is a typical autoimmune disease, self-immune disease. That's, uh, Derrida wrote a, a, a fantastic passage speaking about uh, uh, September 11, 
uh, about the autoimmune disease and the way in which the need of protection ultimately drive society to the self suicide to self suicidal mm -hmm. aspects that's that's for sure and once again uh, uh, going back to the question of Eliza and Alessandro uh, um, how to to deal with the past once again the element at stake are are goes far far away i mean the mystical self uh, isolation that I, I studied because I like mysticals uh, in an in a, in extraordinary way. I'm Italian, Alessandro. That's, that's true. They, it, it is, is not, it, it, it is not similar. It's technically, yes, you have the same, but the means to do that were totally different from the means today and the means to, of the self reclusion the self confinement today they are deadly because exactly they are not the means used for mysticals which was not deadly they they died but for other reason because they were <laughs> christ but that's another question hi Anna. thank you sorry to <laughs> Is dominating um, and taking the space. What I wanted to ask you about was I haven't read your whole book, but I wondered as you're talking about screens uh, and you're conceiving of things becoming, you know, I almost want to think about Surlean of soap bubble worlds, right? How does sound to you come to in different paradigms? Because off the top of my head, I know that I can see some people will use sound as kind of a um, something that prevents them from acknowledging their own loneliness and i'm thinking of a lot of previous 20th century discourses about wagner hate and inability to deal with people and also potentially as a protection from the protection of the screen yeah you know, you know. Um, so i wanted to hear you talk about yeah that. yeah thank Thank you. That, that's interesting because there is an economy of protection. I mean, there are means opposed to other means as a more economic. Uh, I mean, don't send your, your daughter, don't let your son to play video games. Send him in a group uh, protecting him with other means. There is a, a sort of conflict. And the same for screens. Screens are many. And I'm fascinated by this idea. I, I, I will think about that. Screens protecting against the screens protection. That that's true. Yes, you can you can multiply the plans of that. Uh, I I try to avoid uh, 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 any ontology. I do not know what is a screen. <laughs> <laughs> a screen is there what it is in connect, connected with the dispositive for which is it is a screen so it's it, it's it's useful to i'm i'm a little bit scared to generalize too much and also this is the reason why i i do not want to to apply to everything i want to avoid the idea that uh, protection becomes an umbrella mm -hmm. term for covering everything. Anyway, I think that uh, we need to be protected. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, last, la last question. Last question yes. uh, thank you, Francesca. It's a beautiful book, what I've read of it so far, and it seems to me that this is a perfect place for it rather than film and media studies. I say this as the very <laughs> expansive chair of film and media studies, but because this is a more porous place in, in so many ways than, than other uh, disciplinary homes. But I wanted to ask you a, a quick question because I read more of the bubbles section. I thought you would be stricter with Slotterdijk, who I still consider the greatest thief of the German tradition. Uh, <laughs> I really do. Um, and I thought you'd be stricter with him. But I thought at the end of the book, you moved to a, maybe a topological 
model, where it's not a, a matter of stages of protection and then projection, but it's a topological where there's no inside and no outside, yes. and it happens in this kind of, and that for me was like the great insight, why, why I shouldn't be upset that my daughter's always in her screens. Uh, that was to me like the great insight of that moment, so that there the the sec two and second, like two dimensions and three dimensions or so, are actually superseded by, by something different. And I thought that maybe, did, but maybe I misunderstood yeah. you. I thank you so much, and and I find I find that is really a radical question. Yes, the book at the end says something that is a scandal. Ultimately, ultimately the threats are produced by the protection. I think that the protection is materialize our fears and produce the threats we are thinking to face. Not because they are not. But, uh, but, uh, but as, as usual, as in all the cultural techniques, is a cultural technique in order to define not only exterior and interior, but also to, to, to define the fear zone and, and the safe. And I think that this is the real implication in governmentality today of what I'm speaking of, because this is the obsessive element to define somebody terrorist, not because he's not, because the definition, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the definition, define my territory, your territory, define my property, your property, define what is a campus and what is of campus. For example, I, any time I'm thinking, the, the, the idea that we, we have, uh, all we have, including we need, we need to get into, into this building, this doesn't work outside the campus. And it's one of the most territorialized element ever. And this is an element of protection, and it, pro it defines is defined and it defines a territory. But exactly what you say, a topological approach that reverse the cause and the effect, uh, provide the fact that uh, we can say, finally, the campus in, is it an effect or an invention of that. <laughs> Thank, With you. That note, thank you, Francesco. I, I mean, I just want to thank you.